you're literally seconds away from having the biggest high you're probably ever yeah. going to have <laughs> to all of a sudden having one of the biggest lows you're ever going to have. It was a, a real struggle at that time. That was hard. I, mm. I found that really difficult because, again, the same euphoria that we had it comes crashing, crashing down and, 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 and whistles away. Sure, if we win the World Cup, I'll, I'll be... <laughs> that goes out the window. I haven't seen Harry, he's there. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. My name is Kelvin, and this is Copper 90's Game of Fives, a show where we share the stories and anecdotes that capture the best of football fan culture. Um, I'm really, really lucky to just be surrounded by football in royalty, but then also actual royalty. Like, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, the topic that we wanted to start on is just about football memories. And I wanted us to maybe take our minds back to our first ever football memories. Yeah, I think the, the one that I remember and stands out the most is probably, uh, I scored this goal, I was playing for Ridgeway Rovers at the time, I think mm -hmm. I was about, probably about five years old. Um, I scored this goal where I kind of opened up on my, on my right and kind of whipped it back on the left. Yeah. It's them seven aside goals, uh, hit the bar, went in. Um, and I remember it so clearly because on the way home, um, mm -hmm my dad gave me a fiver for scoring that goal. It was like yes. such a good goal, like his <laughs> five pound, I remember. Um, Mine wouldn't be playing in a specific game. Um, mm. I'm lucky enough to have two amazing older brothers. And yeah. I remember my first house that I ever lived in, um, from the moment I could walk, them two practicing with me constantly, throwing me balls, left foot, yes. right foot, <laughs> being out there in my nappy. Um, <laughs> literally, I remember it like yesterday. Uh, I'd say that's probably my earliest football memory and when I first fell in love with football. Mm. What about you, William? Yeah, so, I was about to say, different, different <laughs> level here. Uh, <laughs> didn't quite go on to the same things these guys well, We're did. the amateur legends. We're here. definitely we amateur legends here. Um, no, I think my first memory a long time ago was playing football at school. Mm. Um, and we used to do a thing called sets football. So the whole school yes. used to play one game. And they used to throw three or four footballs on at the same time. Wow. So you'd have like 60 people playing with three or four footballs running around. So you had these little sort of mini games going on within a big game. And that was really fun to get everyone really interested in football. It was just a mass kind of, there were, you know, each uh, ball had a referee following it as well. So right. it was complete carnage <laughs> yeah. and chaos. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was mayhem. And I just thought, you know what, this is, this is really fun. You could play it with loads of people. And I just mm. thought, come on. And that's what sort of led me on to just wanting to play more and more football. It was just the, the sheer um, size and scale and, and just the fun of everyone running around chasing each other. I loved it. 100%. What position did you play? I was a defender. Jeez. Oh, these guys. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was, you know, stuck at the back and told to just tackle. <laughs> Safe, safety at the back with him. Don't put him in the front. Is so. there a player that you'd say you'd model your game on? Yeah, Rhea Ferdinand, he was kind of ahead of me a little bit as, as, as time was just going on. Just a little bit, isn't it? Just a little <laughs> bit. Um, and Rio was, you know, he was, he was, you know, doing the job and doing an amazing job. So I'd say I, I look to him for inspiration when you're playing and you yeah. kind of go, you know, what did you miss? What did you not do? But no, I didn't really, I played more football than I watched it actually when I was younger. Oh, amazing. Because of course, don't forget, but, you know, when I was younger anyway, we didn't have mobile phones. Yeah. So watching football and getting data on football yeah. stats, it was much harder. You had to read the back of the page. Or yeah. almost, I'm almost as old as CFAX, I'd be like, you know, <laughs> that far back. So actually the playing was much more important than actually watching football for me back then. It's, it's switched now because I'm getting older. <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, it was the, the joy of, of playing the game. And I guess, and we've all covered it, like, that feeling of camaraderie, that feeling of friends that help us, I guess, extend our love for the game, right? It's been well documented. We, we love the relationship that we see with you and Mount kind of so, so widely seen, right? It's mm. so wholesome, it's so powerful. And I guess for all of you guys, I wanted to know what role do friends play in helping you, I guess, grow your experience of the game and also in life in general? I don't know if you wanted to make I think reflect. for me, some of the best people you know, I've ever met and connected with have come from football. There's that sense of wanting to fight for someone, um, yeah. wanting to get the three points with your friend on the pitch. Um, even in training when we have like small-sided games here at England, there's, yeah. there's a competitive edge. You know, you really want to do well for each other. Mm. Um, and of course, like you said, with me and Mason, you know, we've been be best friends since we was eight years old. So yeah. to be playing for England together, um, you know, it's just such a special connection and a special bond and mm. such a proud moment as well. Again, some of the greatest friendships you know, are born from playing games and, and yeah. being, you know, pushed together uh, in, mm. you know, slight adversity. Mm. And I, I've definitely got loads of friends who, you know, that relationship started off in a team, fighting yeah. for each other and, and wanting to do the best for the school and for each other and, and, and the team. And so it's really important that we have those moments and we have those people in our lives that give us that support, that mean it's okay, because there's gonna be plenty of time when it's not okay. And yeah. those moments then you come and say, listen, let's have a beer, let's sit down, let's have a chat, or let's, 
have a cup of tea and, and have a natter about it because you know I've got something on my chest or I'm bothered by this or maybe things didn't go quite like you hoped. And I think having those people in your life is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess has there been a moment maybe um, starting with you guys when maybe you've had an injury or maybe you've felt a lot of pressure on maybe social media because we know how big social media can impact you know our relationship to the sport. Has there ever been a moment where your friend has stepped in and maybe given you that sense of release and given you that piece of advice? Early on in my career, you know, I remember making a mistake in a game, I think in my third game in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. um, I give the ball away, you know, the team went and scored, I got subbed off at half time. Mm -hmm. And after the game, it's, you know, head down moment. You know, mm -hmm. what have I done wrong? You see tags, you see people saying stuff to you. Yeah. Um, and I'll never forget, I remember Mark Noble pulling me, captain at the time and just saying, just putting his arm around me like a little thing, like a, yeah. a top captain would do and making me feel special and just said, you don't need to worry about that. He said, you just need to keep going. He mm. said, keep your head down, you're a great lad. He said, you don't need to read any of that stuff online because none of that actually matters. Mm. He says, what matters is what the manager says and what the boys here think of you. And I thought, you know what, why am I going to listen to what someone else is going to say when I've got someone like that who cares and, you know, supports me. And from that moment on, I just took that, moment, um, that bit of advice on board and, you know, try to carry that with me, you know, ever since now that I've been captain as well. Amazing. Um, I now wanted to move us on into a little bit of conversation around kind of our experiences and memories of England, both as fans and obviously as two players, professionals. We are grassroots legends, 600 appearances. <laughs> I'm just fans. <laughs> this is it. 31 goals between us. We scored 29. At least that. At least that. At least yeah. that. At least that. Um, but I wanted you to all reflect on with me um, your first memory of England that really kind of made you fall in love with the national team. I don't know if he wanted to kick off. Maybe William, do you want to yeah, kick, I kick off? Yeah, kick off. Yeah, amazing. Um, so again, you know, playing football yeah. when I was younger um, was the best. It kind of just bred everything. And then as I got a little bit older, I sort of wanted to be more involved in what the national team were up to and more club sort of side of things. And I think uh, quite a strong memory of early early days was was you know donning an English shirt, going to the pub with my, with my mates and, and watching England play in the big tournaments. And I think it, pretty much when Wayne Rooney appeared on, on scene, yeah. that was a big moment for me yeah, growing I'm up. Really I, 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 I thought Rooney, he started, you know, 17 when he you know, did his first game. And there was something very um, just like powerful, it, it really interesting about how Wayne played mm. uh, and the, kind of the, the sort of the, the steel he brought to the England team. Mm. And I think for me, it was Euro 2004, am I right mm, saying that? Yeah. When Wayne really delivered on the yeah. international stage and was you know, right up there leading the, the, the sort of charge as to how England should play him. It was being in the pub again uh, and everyone watching the TV, the, bringing the country together and everyone's rooting for the TV, everyone's shouting, everyone's yeah. getting overexcited. We've all got huge expectations. <laughs> Come on, Wayne, and everyone's yeah. going to do it. And I, that's what I loved about football as well. You, it really brought everyone yeah. together and it's some... Um, you know, it's, you know, don't put too much pressure on the boys. But, <laughs> <laughs> get what I say, but it's it is it is it's a family within a family, I think, and that's what really got me more than more than the result. It was the is the fact that I just felt like I could go and have a natter to this guy in the corner who clearly had been there far too long in the pub, <laughs> um, and, and we'd have a great the, chat. The yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because like, after 2018, after the the World Cup, that, that was the main thing people kind of went out because we was in our own little bubble, you know, we mm -hmm. was out in Russia, we was in our own hotel, didn't really see many people and obviously we was doing so well, but um, but we could only see the videos online and going around, yeah. the pubs going crazy, yeah. the beers Box everywhere. Park. Yeah, so, uh, but then when, obviously, unfortunately, we, uh, we got knocked out in the semi-final, but when, mm. that got, when we got back, that, that was the moment people were saying, it's just, people were just in the street, just mm -hmm. talking to random people they'd never known, uh, mm -hmm. getting to know different people. I think the Euros as well though, yeah. the way that was obviously at Wembley, all of the games and us obviously being at St George's, being here at the Lodge and obviously yeah. getting as far as, as far as we got. Yeah. Obviously as an England fan and as a player, just seeing how the whole country come together and yeah. the impact we was having on people, it was just, it was incredible and it was wanting to make you, you know, really push and fight even more to, to, get, up, to get over the line and obviously yeah. in the end it wasn't meant to be but even after that, the reaction of the country and the people and mm -hmm. people coming up to you in the street, um, rival fans coming up to you saying nice things, you know, it was just a whole, it was a whole change and it was really, really nice. Mm. Yeah. From a playing perspective, what has been your favourite playing memories for England? Uh, 
I think I always go back to my debut for, yeah, for England. Yeah. Um, I was coming off the bench. Um, the ball didn't go out for like five minutes. And I, was, <laughs> I was so excited to play. I was just like, get me on. It was like 70 minutes. I wanted to get as many minutes as possible. Yeah. Uh, it was at Wembley. So it was just like, oh, I can't wait to get on. Thankfully, the ball went out and uh, I come on for Wayne, um, which was great as well. Obviously, growing up watching Wayne and him being a, one of my idols growing up. So mm. that was an amazing experience. Got a great reception from the crowd uh, and then managed to score within, I think it was like within three minutes. Um, and yeah, just that feeling of just, you know, I dreamed of playing for England my whole life, my mm. whole um, childhood. And to have that moment and I had my friends, my family in, in the crowd at Wembley. I think I'm going to have to say the same. Yeah. Um, my debut, um, obviously we, we played against Czech Republic and I remember being told by the fitness coach to warm up, start of the second half and straight away then you're thinking, when can I come on? Um, mm. and you're just itching really. Uh, mm. And it was a nice moment to come on in the game, you know, managed to, to play half an hour at Wembley, you know, yeah. with, with top players. My family there, it was just such a, such a special moment. Um, mm. you know, I, think, I don't think you can get any better in football. And I think if there's one game that I think that was to stand out, I think H would, would say as well, the Germany game in the Euros. Yeah. I feel like <laughs> us as players, we've we even spoke about that the last trip, just the, the whole atmosphere and, you know, the, the, the magnitude of the game. And, you know, we knew that if we didn't win, you know, we're getting sent home. Or if we win, you know, mm. we really progress. And to win that at Wembley against Germany, um, the fans Huge after, fun. I remember singing Sweet Caroline yeah. in front of yeah. the families. Yeah. It was just such a special moment, yeah. um, obviously, because we couldn't see the family. We could see them right in front of us, but we couldn't actually physically contact them. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that game as well is one of my highest, highest memories for England, for sure. Picking up on that a little bit, and for all three of you guys, the experience of going out alone, moving away from home, separated from family for a long time, and having to deal with football in a bit more of a competitive way, but then also having to deal with being far away from those friends and family that are like your foundations. What has that sometimes felt like, and how has that impacted your mental health at times? It's not easy, I think, sometimes when you're on your own, um, when you find yourself not in the team and you're not playing and then you go back to your, your house or your apartment and then you're just sitting there thinking, what can I do? Um, mm. I'm working as hard as I can, but I'm just not quite getting the opportunity. And that was a time as well, I really found my inner self-belief and um, it was a moment in my career where I really had to kind of dig deep and feel like, okay, if I want to really become who I know I can become, I need to work hard, I need to believe in myself more. Just trying to like, have that inner, that inner self-belief to know, yeah. okay, let me just keep working and things are going to turn around. I think at 14 and 15 years old for me was a, a real struggle. Um, yeah. you know, I was at Chelsea before, five minutes from my house. Um, obviously get released from Chelsea and then have to sign for West Ham, which meant then I had to move away from home at 14. Um, mm. you know, for someone that's so close to my mum and dad, it was a, a real struggle at that time. Um, you know, really, really homesick. Um, I remember being on the phone to my mum most nights, um, you know, upset, saying that I miss her, miss mum and dad, because it was all I ever knew. But it got easier as I got older. Like Harry said, that self-belief of, you know, knowing that you want to do this for your profession, you know, you want to give everything. And, you know, in the end, I got through it. But there were times when I remember my mum coming to the digs and speaking to the lady and saying that she wanted me to come home because of the calls that I was giving her, saying that I missed home and that I wasn't enjoying it. Um, but in the end, I stuck it out. Um, and, you know, I had self-belief that I could get through that time. And like Harry said, you know, there was a few close people that got me through that moment as well. So I'm really grateful for that. You both mentioned about the self-belief quite a lot, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Do, can you elaborate a little bit as to where some of that self-belief comes from? Because obviously mm -hmm. it's, it's experience levels, it's what you're exposed to, it's the support structures. What, what specifically do you guys you know, mean about the self-belief and, and, and how did you build that up? Like my career, I was never someone who kind of went straight to the top and I was always mm. spoke about at a young age and he's going to be the next best thing. I was more, people didn't really know if I was good enough and I had to really work on my game to, to improve. And so in my head it was, okay, just whenever I get the opportunity in the first team or uh, for Tottenham, I'll be ready to take that. I think it's the same, it's really similar to Harry's really. I was never seen as the best player or, or some, someone that was guaranteed you know, to make it at the top, but I knew I had to work, um, I knew there was obstacles to overcome and that's where that belief come from. You know? you know, I was a good player, I wasn't the best, but I believed that you know, I was going to have a profession in the game. Um, and I feel like you've got to believe that. The character and personality that you have to show at that age as well, um, it comes in really well. And, I just really believed in myself at that moment in time and you know, even to this day it's, it's taken me a long way. 
Yeah. It's just interesting the difference between self-belief and self-doubt 100%. and what kind of a route your life takes. You know, self-belief is so crucial, but self-doubt is lurking always on both sides yeah. of, the, of everyone's lives, no matter what walk of life you're in. And it's just it's so, you know, if you take a wrong path or something happens, it's none of your, your control, you can end up in the self-doubt quite quickly and then things can get much harder. And I guess that leads us on to kind of our next topic, which, yeah, I guess we've started to reflect on a little bit, but I actually wanted to understand from each and every single one of you a moment where football has maybe been quite difficult um, and you've kind of struggled a little bit within the game. And I don't know, William, if you wanted to kick us off um, just with a personal anecdote. I think my personal anecdote will be very different to theirs. <laughs> <laughs> this particular one. But I'll try and, I'll try and do justice to the question. Um, I think, you know, again, probably from a fan point of view is my yeah. easiest way to, to, to answer that one. And obviously it's, it's disappointment, more than anything, it's handling disappointment. Um, and again, you know, you learn by playing a number of times and many other things in life that disappointment is part of life. And yeah. How you handle it is crucial. So I think, you know, handling some of those really um, disappointing England results in the past, um, that, was, that was hard. I, mm. I found that really difficult because, again, the same euphoria that we had it comes crashing, crashing down and, 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 and whittles away. And, and that's quite hard to take because you feel all on a high, you feel all together, and then suddenly your normal life just gets back on again and it's like, well, where did that all go? Yeah. Yeah. Was, that, was that real? What happened? And how do I get that feeling back? Yeah. And, and yet football has that ability to just put it all on a plate for you and then suddenly just take it all away and go, yeah. until next time, you know, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Yeah. So. yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I think the, the easiest one, probably for both of us, is obviously the Euro final, is to come as close as a penalty shootout and then in, in that moment, you're literally seconds away from having the biggest high you're probably ever yeah. going to have <laughs> to all of a sudden having one of the biggest lows you're ever yeah. going to have. But in that moment, still being there for each other in that low, obviously, mm. um, I think one of the greatest things about the Euros, obviously, when Bukayo missed the penalty and yeah. everyone ran over and made sure he was okay. And I think uh, Calvin Phillips was um, was there first, and um, that was a real powerful moment. I think just to know that okay, yeah. we were still stood up and backed our teammates yeah. and backed each other. And um, yeah, th those moments are so tough. You know, you have so many big highs, and then to just to have that, like you said, that just complete low. And until next time, and hopefully next time will be. Uh, in a few uh, in a few weeks time that would yeah. be uh, that would be nice but uh, I guess that leaves you feeling um, yeah you, that hunger to, yeah. to go and achieve what we didn't quite uh, obviously a couple of years ago yeah I think like what Harry said my definitely the, the the worst moment of my career so far is that Euros final losing mm. that um, and obviously I was subbed off in the final so I was watching the penalties from the side and mm. You know, you're constantly thinking, what if it, you know, if we're going to win this, how are you going to run on? How are you going <laughs> to celebrate? And that, you can't help but think that's going to go through your mind. So obviously yeah. when, you know, when you lose and, you know, you see the, the Italians run off and celebrate, you know, for me it was, it was heartbreaking. But there was a special moment after that game. I think the togetherness we showed when we all come in a huddle mm -hmm. um, after we'd lost that. And Gareth said some really, you know, important words. And as a group, I think that, that brought us forward together because then we had to qualify for a World Cup. Um, mm. in the next round of games and you know I think we've done that and Italy didn't manage to do that you know mm. so I think we, we really overcome that setback of losing that final um, showed our togetherness and our strength and you know, I feel like we we're in a really good place you know as a national team that you know we can keep pushing and, and getting better because the togetherness we've built mm. is really special to be a part of. I mean, we've got a World Cup in a few weeks, firstly. <laughs> <laughs> Which feels weird, doesn't it? It feels I mean, like so mad. Approaching the, 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 the autumn and then we're going to the World Cup. I can't really, I mean, it's right. weird for you guys yeah. too. I think the biggest challenge, I think, for a lot of teams is going to be that mindset of switching yeah. straight into, this is a major tournament. This is, yeah. isn't just preparation games. This isn't just qualif uh, qualification games. This is the first game in the group stage. And we all know how important the first game in a... In a in a World Cup or a Euros can be so um, that would be our biggest challenge. But I think with the team we got and the and the character we've shown and the experience we've we've gained over the last four or five years, especially, um, should put us in a in a good place for it. And yeah. I'm really excited for it. I can't <laughs> wait to be there. So can I ask a question, guys, about the highs and lows of football? Yeah, because I think that I mean, we sort of touched on it a little bit. But I, I'm always fascinated because sport is the, the pinnacle of those moments, the most obvious where we all yeah. relate to it. But in our normal lives, it still happens through family moments, weddings, whatever it might be. Um, how, do you, how do you feel you can, you can manage those feelings? 
because obviously as you get as you get more experience and you've done more caps, mm -hmm. presumably you can you regulate it better and you understand it, you feel it. But some of the mm -hmm. new guys coming in and when you first started playing for England and you won and, and lost or whatever, mm -hmm. how do you how do you manage all that? I'm always someone in the back of my mind. It's always about okay, the next thing, um, and I don't want to get too high and and then come crashing down. I don't want to get too low where I can't get back up. I want to just uh, kind of like vary in between. So I'm really conscious of that, and I really try and keep myself kind of in a in a kind of steady uh, medium, but. I'm sure if we win the World Cup, I'll, I'll be... <laughs> that goes out the window. I've not seen Harry, he's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, won't be able to, uh, I don't think I'll be able to, to manage that. But, um, yeah, throughout, throughout my career and, and the years, and, and, and even personal life as well, mm. and I'm, I've got three kids now, and, you know, trying to uh, juggle that with the amount of games and the schedule. And, um, and your foundation. Yeah, too. and uh, just launched a foundation, which is... Really exciting for me, I think, talking here about um, different stuff, highs and lows we've been through, and uh, that's my aim is to kind of, t especially the younger generation, to talk to them and try and change their perspective on talking about mental health, and mm. um, the more we talk about it and open up, it will definitely help um, help solve, especially when, when you're a little bit lower. I remember getting released, I remember the day I got released by Chelsea, like, like yesterday, I remember getting home from school um, and my dad coming in and, you know, we was all sat there thinking I was going to, you know, stay on at Chelsea and get another two year contract and he told us that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to be kept on, I was going to be released and you know, I, remember, I remember bursting into tears because it was all I ever knew, but then straight away I remember, I don't know how it works in the academy system, but obviously coaches get informed and then that night I went and trained with Fulham. So at, mm. I got, I got released from Chelsea, I found out at like four o'clock and then at seven o'clock I'm training Same. with Fulham. Um, of course it was a disappointment in that moment, but I just wanted to become a footballer so much and I didn't want anything to get in the way of that. I just wanted to, to shift my mind, shift my focus. I didn't want to just be sat at home, moping around and you know, fall out of love with a game. I just wanted to get back on with it, I wanted to keep improving and go and test myself at different clubs. And I loved the time at Fulham, I was there for a couple of weeks, but then eventually chose West Ham and yeah. you know, kicked on from there. So. Yeah, obviously it was rejection at the time. It was also that, like Tate said, self-belief and drive that, you know, I really wanted to do this as a profession and I believed in myself. But also how important support structures are for both of you there, yeah. isn't it? That moment of rejection, you've got your dad putting your arm around you or you've got people to rely on. And it must be very difficult for a lot of people who don't have those support networks around yeah. them to kind of be able to know who to lean on. And we, we all need it in all walks of life. Yeah. It's so important we have those, those yeah. support networks to catch us a little bit when we're down. Yeah, and I know you do a lot of work also with organisations that step in when, you know, those immediate support structures aren't there. And I didn't know if you want to maybe talk to us a little bit about the Shout campaign um, and how incredibly useful that is for people who are struggling with their mental health. Definitely. So, and, and I, I'm going to start with, with Harry here because he very kindly has uh, donated the Leighton Orient sponsorship shirts um, so for the um, sponsors to Shout. Yeah. So um, it's, it's really pertinent you bring that up. But obviously... Talking about mental health, Shout was something we came about with um, to do with uh, people in crisis. Mm. And effectively, it's 24 hour texting. So it's the only service in the UK that does that. Mm. And it allows people to air and talk about things that they might not want to do in this sort of forum. Mm. Eye to eye contact, sitting around a table, talking about things. Instead, you can, you know, the written yeah. word is quite powerful. You can say things, just send the button and it, you get someone back. And, it's important, it's not a computer at the other end, it's a real person. Mm. So it's someone who's trained, someone who's listening, someone who's got a number of uh, ways and volunteering time to give towards the text. Mm. And not only does crisis be there for a moment, because a lot of what people go through is, is a moment. Mm. Some of the severe mental health issues and when everyone's having a real bad moment, it, it's transitory. So you might feel at that moment, there's, no, there's nowhere else to go. But if you can get someone through that moment, yeah. there is brighter light coming out of the other side of it. So Shout was there to, to, to catch people uh, like an almost support network and just carry them through those darker moments and bring them out to somewhere on the other side. Mm -hmm. And what Shout does very well is signpost to other organizations. So it doesn't have all the answers, but what it can do is give you, yeah. you know, if you're a parent struggling, it takes you off in that direction. If you're a recovering alcoholic, it takes you off in that direction. Mm -hmm. So it's got something for everyone. And the people behind Shout, the volunteers are amazing. It's a huge network now. And a lot of people have had 
similar issues and they want to give back time. Some have never had any issues of mental health and yet have learned so much about it by doing the volunteering. Um, and I'm you know, really proud about it. Um, it's one of those services that I felt, Catherine and I were like, looking around, this is really missing. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's without a doubt saved quite a lot of lives, so really proud of it. Amazing, the incredible work that you do. And I think this has been a really, really powerful conversation. I think we need more kind of forums where either we can come together with our friends, family, or our networks and be able to open up about our mental health or lean to organizations like Shout where that conversation is a little bit more difficult, but actually we can speak to somebody across the phone who can provide us that support. I just wanted to thank you all for joining us on this conversation and wish you two the best of luck um, in a few weeks' time. Thank you. Uh, no pressure, boys. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> you, got, you got this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I've been Kelvin, and thank you guys very much. Yes, thank, you. thank you.